Good morning church, Pastor Bradley here, I'm really excited today to be continuing on in our series of Red Letter Living, um, looking at the final words of Jesus on the cross and seeing how that applies to our lives, see about how it affects in every aspect of our lives. And, and we're starting today, we're going to look at I am thirsty. And before we get there, you know, the apologies, we won't have any worship today online for our online church service. Um, as I mentioned in the garden, I baptized my laptop with coffee, so it's broken at the moment. So we've got someone else helping with the edits or of the, of the sermon, so we can get that up at least. But hopefully by next week we'll be back on track with worship and in the garden and everything. Um, Lord willing, we'll be running smoothly. So today we unpacking those words in John 19, 28 to 30, where Jesus says, I am thirsty. And this is more than, I believe this is more than Jesus just showing us his humanity. It's more than Jesus just relating to us um, when we're thirsty in the night and we wake up. This is Jesus showing us that he is actually the answer to everything we've been looking for. He is the thirst quencher. He is the life giver. He is our all-consuming satisfaction that can be found in him. And, and I'll read, I'll start of John 19 verse 28, right? And it's coming in right to the door. Jesus is on the cross. Right towards the end, it says, Jesus knew that his mission was not finished. And other translation will say he completed everything he had to do for the Father. And to fulfill scripture, he said, I am thirsty. I am thirsty. As, as a jar of sour wine was sitting there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put it on a hyssop branch, and held it up to his lips. When Jesus tasted it, he said, it is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. And we're going to jump right in this morning. We've got three points. And our first point is Jesus is thirsty. Jesus is thirsty. And I'll ask the question, I know the answer is yes. Do you know what it's like to be thirsty? Do you know what it's like to have dry lips or a craving for just any liquid just to parch your, your quench or quench your thirst? Right? Or a kid on a long trip that just wants something to drink every five minutes because he thinks he's going to die or, or dehydrate. And I'm not trying to equate our, our, our understanding of thirst with Jesus, what Jesus must be experiencing on the cross. But there's a sense that Jesus was not just revealing his humanity. Eh? He wasn't just trying to say, hey, I too know what it's like to be thirsty. He was saying there's something more unfolding. There's something more behind the scenes with the words that I've uttered that I want you to know that true contentment, true um, quenching is found in Christ and Christ alone this morning. And some scholars suggest that, that, that this is the, the prophecy of words uttered in Psalm 69, 21 that says, They gave me poison for food, and my thirst they gave me sour wine to drink. And for my thirst they gave me sour wine to drink. And we're not really sure if this actually fits the, the context of what Jesus was saying, because only half of the words or the end of the verses actually relates to what Jesus was saying. And, and other times with prophecy from the Old Testament to the New Testament is crystal clear. Yeah, it's not exactly crystal clear if that is the text he's talking about. And other scholars suggest where I think I put my hands and say, yes, Lord, this seems to be fit much better in this instance it is that there's a reference to the time of the Israelites in the wilderness. And this is a period in the Israelites' history where they were, were in kept, captivity and slaves and they've just been freed. And in their freedom, they just start to become a complaining, embittered, frustrated nation that just is never happy with the presence and the, the provision of God in their lives. That even though God is with them day and night, even though God is guiding and directing them, God is speaking to them, God is sustaining them, they still seem to ask the question, is God in us? Where is God? And this kind of, on a journey through, through um, the wilderness, God starts by providing flaky frost flakes or whatever it is on the ground and they start to eat and consume. And after a while they move from this place where God is providing manna from heaven and they move on to a new place and they get to this new place and it's desolate and there's no water, there's just rocks. And they start to freak out again, right? The Israelites always believed the past was better than the future. They always believed being in captivity was better than being free in Christ. They, they enjoyed the past sins more than they enjoyed the freedom of Christ moving forward, even though they, because it was uncomfortable. So, so I'll leave that there. So Exodus 17 verse 3, and the, the Israelites are complaining to Moses, right? And Moses takes it to God and he's like, well, what must I do with these people? They're just arguing the whole time. So they said this, but tormented by thirst, 
right? Tormented by thirst. Well, the translation said that they, they, they had nothing to drink, right? They were thirsty. They continued to argue with Moses. Why did you bring us out of Egypt? Are you trying to kill us, our children, and our livestock with thirst? Right? Thirst for the Israelites was more than just not having anything to drink. It was a whole well-being. If you read the end of Exodus 17, right at the, 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 the end, there's a verse that says, they, they wanted to know, was God really with us? Is God in us? See, for the Israelites in, in the wilderness, thirst represented the presence of God. Thirst represented God keeping His promises. Thirst represented, was God enough in our circumstances, even though we go through trials, tribulations, and hardship, is God enough? And that's the question many of us ask, or if we're honest, as we go through life, as we make decisions, as we plan our things, as whatever it is, is God sufficient? Is God actually affecting how I act, think, and interact with the world around me? Because we all have this thirst inside of us, right? This God-shaped hole that we try to fill with everything going on around us. And we're asking the question, is God really with us? Is God really enough? Right, and we need to understand that the Israelites were not just complaining once off like a, this, like a child that is complaining about one meal. It was continually built into the Israelites' DNA that they were complaining, moaning, ungrateful people. And, and what we see for that whole era that they were in the wilderness, it was defined by, by ungratefulness. Right, and, uh, uh, and ungratefulness defined their season. And the challenge there is we look at the, the Israelites as they go through different things, as I mentioned this week in the garden, is don't let ungratefulness define an era of your life. Don't let busyness or confusion or frustration define the season of your life. Rather fix your eyes on God and know that He is sufficient and good and with you amidst what we don't understand. Right, and, and our thirst is what they're saying. And God leads the Israelites through Moses to an area where they can drink. Um, and it goes on to say it would be out of the rock. And what we know about Jesus, He's the rock of ages. He's the rock, a foundation a, a, you know, on which everything is built. Isaiah 24, 6 verse 4 says, Trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord God is an everlasting rock. So the statement um, or feelings that we're, we're complaining about, about is God enough? God, Jesus is trying to say, I am the rock to which you will find satisfaction. I am the rock in which your thirst will be quenched. I am the, the rock in which identity and purpose is to be found. See, Jesus is saying, I am the rock. I am living water. I am everything you need. He is, and once again, as He took all our sin upon Himself, He is becoming our dissatisfaction. He is becoming our longing. He is becoming our thirst in the spiritual that we would be able to be quenched in that moment. That we would know the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We would know the, 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 the fullness of God in our lives to guide and direct and, and give us joy, meaning, and purpose. See, those of Jesus would have understood that at the time and would have understood the context of I am thirsty. See, when we want to look up scripture, we go to Google or check the back of our Bibles, have an index or a concordance, or we ask a friend or ask the pastor where this verse is, and I'm like, I don't know, let me check Google for you. <laughs> um, but, but biblically, in those times, it was the responsibility to teach your children scripture, and you would often have to recite parts of scripture or memorize scripture before you left the house. So imagine just parenting through that. You're running late, your kid has no pants on or shoes on, and you're like, put your shoes on and recite Leviticus. And let's go, we're going to be late. Right, that's a <laughs> very thankful that we, we don't have to recite scripture before leaving the house in the morning. But it's a great practice to have to memorize scripture, to learn scripture, to read scripture together. But in response to who Jesus reveals himself to be throughout scripture, we need to ask the question, are we thirsty for Jesus? Because Jesus is highlighting that He is what we crave. He is what we need. He became a dissatisfaction so that we could be satisfied in Him. But our second point this morning we can ask is, are we thirsty for Jesus? Because I know we're thirsty. I know we long for so much more in this world. But do we long for Jesus? Do we long for a closeness and an affection with Jesus? Do we long for His guiding and directing in our lives? Do we long for His embrace and, and, and interjection into our lives? Because Matthew 5 verse 6, Jesus says, it says, Blessed are you if you hunger and thirst for righteousness, for you shall be full. And Jesus is our righteousness. Jesus is pure and holy and worthy of it all. And Jesus is saying, you will be satisfied and you will... If you 
follow and pursue me. It's a promise of Scripture. It's a promise of Scripture we need to hold into in our tumultuous, tumultuous times that we find ourselves in. That God is enough. His satisfaction is enough. We can be found in Him. And do we thirst for God this morning? Do we bring Him our thirst to be satisfied in living waters? The same promise He makes to the Samaritan woman at the well in John 4, John 4 verse 4. And in John 4 verse 4 onwards, Jesus comes to the well, the disciples go fetch food, and He's sitting at this well, and a Samaritan woman walks out, and Jesus says, Can you give me something to drink? And there's an exchange saying, the Samaritan woman is, why are you talking to me? You, a Jew, speaking to a Samaritan woman. And we understand that in the biblical context, Samaritans were hated. They were treated as dogs. And that's why even when they insult Jesus later on, they call him a Samaritan instead of a Jew. That was like the, the biggest insult. And now Jesus is showing us, and, and the, in John 4, it says, Jesus was weary and tired. So his disposition in his humanness is he's tired, he's weary, he just wants to rest and have something to drink. And in love, he sees the need. In love, he sees this woman as an opportunity to extend the grace and mercy of God to them, that he allows the interruption to become a point of ministry that would actually radically alter the trajectory of her life and all those that she comes across. Because he loved her, because he allowed love to interrupt his plans and purposes of rest. And that's really important um, in this text that we're looking at when we get to the final point of loving others and, be, and being thirst quenchers in a world that is so thirsty. We need to see with eyes of love and not eyes of inconvenience. Because we will not care for the world or brokenness of this world if we do not see as Jesus sees. So he goes on to that this back and forth. This is if you end. Jesus said to her in verse 10, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked and I would have given you living water. The woman said to her, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with and the well is deep. What, where do you get this living water? Are you greater than the fa our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself. He did so as he did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. That's Anyone that drinks of anything of this world will thirst again. How long does our satisfaction with new bicycles, or new cars, or good meals last? Whatever it is, right? Whatever thrilling pursuit we have in this world, it always leaves us thirsty for more. That's what Jesus says in that one telling verse. Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I give them will never be thirsty again promise Jesus is saying is there's identity, there's purpose, there's foundation in Him that will not be affected by this world. We as Christians need to hold on to that promise and that purpose that we are fine in Him, that identity is not affected by what is going on around us. Our purpose and self-worth is not affected by the opinions of others or the lack of possessions or the abundance of possessions. It's fine in Christ, in Christ alone. It says the water that I will give Him will Come, will become in him a spring of water welling up in eternal life. Right, there's this idea, a spring of welling up, overflowing, wells burst forth, rivers burst their banks for the betterment of those around them rather than for themselves. There's this welling up at the well that Jesus says you will be so satisfied that your satisfaction will overflow to those around you. And we're jumping ahead to our last point, but, but keep that in mind. And then the woman says, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. And, and the, the exchange goes on and back and forth, right? But the woman at the well wanted living waters only Jesus could offer. Church, I want to encourage us this morning, wherever you're listening from, only Jesus can satisfy us. That longing, that niggling, that maybe that's keeping you awake at night, where do I fit in, where do I belong, does anyone care? The answer is Jesus. The answer is Jesus knows, Jesus cares, Jesus is with you, Jesus is for you, Jesus is good, and He is guiding and directing you to a point of satisfaction in Him and Him alone. And our satisfaction will not come in, in, in better relationships, it will not come in better or bigger bank balances, it will not come in better health, it will come in Christ and Christ alone, irrespective of those first three, three things. 
Does God want us to prosper in those things? Yes, every father wants us to, to be in those things, but those things are not essential to our well-being, they are not essential to our satisfaction, and we need to learn to separate the, the things of this world, the horizontal, with our relationship with the vertical, because that is where true satisfaction is found. That is where true joy is found amidst difficult circumstances. Right, and don't miss this, right? Jesus is saying, I am thirsty as a sign that we can be satisfied. Jesus is taking upon him the dissatisfaction we so often feel and, and endure on a daily basis. And he's saying, give it to me because I will bear it. I will die for it, that you will be satisfied in me. Jesus becomes the need to fulfill our ultimate need. Spiritual thirst. Being content and secure in Jesus is a process of change to the Holy Spirit. If we fix our eyes on God, we know that He needs to increase as we decrease. I think that's John 3, 10 or somewhere there. Let Him increase while I decrease. Or John 3, verse 30. And as we seek to make much of Him in our lives, we, we need to see Him in our lives. We need to remind ourselves that He is sufficient. And to the working of the Spirit and the mind of Christ, He will sustain us and satisfy us as He promises in His Word. But it's the daily choices we make that feed our desire for Jesus or our desire for self. It's just the, the human response, the, the human, the Christian responsibility. The daily choices you make will directly affect your, your satisfaction, will directly affect your relationship with God, which ultimately affects your relationship with everyone around you and your relationship with the stuff in your life. Right? When Jesus uttered those words, I'm thirsty. Not showing us that he's actually thirsty. He endured 30, 40 days in the wilderness without food or drink, battling Satan himself. He's trying to show us that there's something more to be found than, than understanding the things of this world, the, the things of the flesh. It's found in him and him alone that he is our eternal waters. He is the water that will quench us and carry us and be with us in all circumstances. His name is Jesus. And as he hung on that cross, he saw you and me in his mind, and he declared that we would not be without. We would not know we are loved. We would not know that we don't belong. We would, we would not know that, that this thirst for the things will not, will, can only be found in him and him alone. And that's what Joel, Joel Bowles, the bell, Joel Bell suggests. He says there was a whole lot more to do with what he could give us than what it was to do with what he actually needed. I am thirsty is about what Jesus has to offer us this morning, church, not what we can, well, not what he actually needed in those moments. And we have to, we've got to figure out how to live a life that brings us into this space, that God space, where we actually live with the well with him. Where we actually live in those streams of living water. And that comes from intentionally including God on a daily basis. That comes from intentionally including church community or loving Christian community. It comes from intentionally loving others and being guided and directed by the Holy Spirit, irrespective to how crazy that may seem at the time. John 7, 38 is clear. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Listen to me, church. Rivers that flow from our heart from time spent with Him. Rivers that flow will be from time spent with God. Rivers that run dry will be time spent with this world and with the flesh. We cannot sustain our lives on fleshly pursuits of things that will quench us. It needs to be in Christ and Christ alone. It's why we need to be adding more of Jesus in our lives and less of ourselves. There's got to be something bubbling up inside of us, this wellspring, this joy, this satisfaction that overflows in how we serve and love one another. Because when our well runs dry, so does our love for people. And when our love runs dry for people, we have, we, we, our dissatisfaction increases. Because the beautiful in intertwining of Scripture and Jesus and Spirit and Christian living is found in the fact that we start to care and love people as Christ would care and love for them. And when we allow ourselves to be dissatisfied, we hinder our, our, our desire to be thirst creatures in other people's lives. To be satisfied in Him and become streams of living water to others. Right? That's what Jesus exemplifies on the cross, that it's not about Him, it's about others. And here's the big, the, big perp, or the big challenge for us, right? The, the big question, how does this affect 
red leather living? How does this affect my life? How does it affect what I do? How does it affect how I engage with the world? How can I live in such a way as to quench others thirst? Because that's the purpose, church, that we would be thirst quenchers. This isn't just about us. It's not just about me being satisfied and content in my little bubble. But it's called for me to be thirst quenchers in others. That I have the streams of living water flowing through me. It's not my own energy. It's not my own strength. It's not my own joy. It's Christ and Christ alone in and through me as it overflows to those around me. Point number three this morning, and it's an identity point. It's an empowering point. It says, I am the thirst quencher. I'm a thirst quencher. You can say that with me wherever you are. I am a thirst quencher. I have clear purpose. I have meaning. I have rivers of living water that I can quench the thirst because it is not me and my own strength. It is Christ through me that allows me to be involved in people's lives as the hand and feet of Christ to them. Right? Because here's the thing. Maturing, mature Christians is where I transition from. Maturing as a Christian is where I transition from making it all about me and the support I need and what I can give and all what I can get to what I can give and where I can serve and where I can love. Jesus shows us that it's not about us. It's about God and His glory and the kingdom advancement. Jesus set the example of being in need to becoming needed. Right? There's, a, there's a slow transition as us as believers, we remove away from it being about us to being about how can I serve. Irrespective of what you have, God is calling us to be loving and kind and caring and generous to the people around us. We see that with the widow that came with almost nothing. We see that again and again that God calls all of us, not just those that have abundance or plenty, He calls all of us to be giving and kind and caring and loving to the world around us. And something every Christian must face on their, on their faith walk as you grow in your faith it is that it's not about you. It's not just about you. Where can you love? Where can you be kind? Where can you be caring? We need to ask, how do we become streams of living water? And it's so crucial. Be secure in Christ. And we become secure in Christ by knowing who we are in Christ through reading scripture, community, promptings of the Holy Spirit and accountability and just saturating ourselves in the knowledge and the wisdom of who God is because then we are found in Him. So irrespective of what happens around us, irrespective of what's going on inside of us, we are secure and found in Christ and Christ alone. That my, my ability to forgive or engage or love or sacrifice is not dependent on me or not dependent on my self-worth because my self-worth is found in Christ alone and He is the rock of ages. He is the foundation to which I am secure and found. And Ephesians 2 verse 10 says, For we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Right? God has a plan for you. The question is, will you walk in it? Will you swim in it as streams of living water that would overflow to those around you? Right? If there's air in your lungs, there should be purpose in your step to love those God places around you. But here's the thing, right, in, in becoming streams of living water, needs require love. If we do not view the world in the eyes of Christ, if we do not see people as individuals rather than people groups, we will not care and we will not love. It's a sad reality, it's what Jesus saw at the woman at the well, he saw an individual in need that needed to be loved. He did not see a Samaritan people group. He saw an individual and a need that he could meet with streams of living water. Our need always requires love. Need always requires us to see things as Jesus sees them. And we see that Jesus was continually interrupted. He was tired and weary at the well. And yet there was a need of a woman to love. He didn't pass judgment on her. You've got five husbands, you're sleeping around, you're unfaithful, you're here because um, in the middle of the day or whatever it was because of all the gossip and everything else, you don't want to be around anyone else. Because of the shame you feel, he didn't judge her, he didn't belittle her, he loved her. He loved her. How radically different our marriages, our neighborhoods, our workplaces would look if we went with an attitude of I see you as Christ sees you as a child of God in need of love and mercy and thirst quenching waters that only Christ can give. And He's using me right now as a fountain of life to pour it out into you in this moment that you would know the goodness and the mercy and the love of God, that you are enough, that you are found, that you are loved, that you are His. 
And, and as we journey that to the people in our lives, we'll see a radically different our relationships start to be. Because we need to train ourselves to see it with a godly love of equality and a better tomorrow. Because love sees need and is not distracted by worldly opinion, but is guided by Jesus' heart for people. Not distracted by what the world says or thinks or defines. We are guided and directed by the streams of living water, which is Jesus' heart for people. We see that again and again. Jesus says, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Maybe you need to come this morning once again to the streams of living water and say, Lord, I need to be satisfied in you. I've become self-centered, I've become selfish, I've made it all about me once again. Lord, fill me so I can be a blessing to others. As it says in Genesis 12, you will be a blessing to be, I will bless you to be a blessing. All about letting Jesus flow through us is where we truly find satisfaction, purpose, and meaning. Tim Keller says, I love this, says, God sees us as we are, loves us as we are, and accepts us as we are. But by His grace, He does not leave us as we are. Love allows us to see the pain and brokenness in people's lives, but also the hope of Jesus to restore. Church, we will become overwhelmed if we don't believe in the Jesus that can restore. We will become burdened to the point of despair if we don't believe Jesus is able. Streams of living water are able to flow into situations through our interactions with people to see kingdom growth. It has to stir within us a confidence, a joy, a hope, a satisfaction, a security, a grace. You can make a difference and help. You can make a difference and help. In the things that only you see that God leads across your path. In the still small promptings to the left or to the right, you can make a difference. And never underestimate the difference of prayer. Never underestimate the difference of a, a kind text message or WhatsApp. Never underestimate the kind words or, or, or of encouragement to one another. You can make a difference. This isn't about financial difference. Yes, some of you can make significant financial differences, no doubt. That's not what Jesus is speaking about here. He's speaking about kingdom growth, kingdom satisfaction. There's so much need in our world. And, and, and you can be part of that. You can be part of the restoring and rescuing through Christ and Christ alone. God sees individuals and not people. God sees you this morning in your need. And He sees those in your life in need. And as we pray for them, maybe God's calling you to step up and step out in faith and in boldness and be streams of living water. Jesus saw a need in all of us and made it possible for us to know Him. On that cross when He says, I am thirsty, He was declaring, you never have to be my children. You never have to be my brothers and sisters, that you would be fine and satisfied in Christ and Christ alone. Through time spent with Him, through time spent in community with other believers, and in overflowing those rivers of living water to those around us as we act in love and fulfill needs. That we would be in the hands and feet of Jesus to Jeffreys Bay, to Jeffreys Bay Baptist Church, to those that God leads across our paths. And we will move that, okay, we will move from a place and just take Him to a place where we are givers in service to the people of our places around us. So may you be blessed today, church. May you be encouraged today, church, that you would find satisfaction in Jesus, that it is a promise that satisfaction can be found in Christ and Christ alone. It can be. We need to run after it with a full pursuit, a full passion, a full desire for the Word of God, the presence of God, the people of God. And so satisfaction is mine and hold on to that promise because it is a promise of God that He would pour it out in us as Jesus endured the dissatisfaction on the cross so we never would have to. And it had nothing to do with circumstances and backgrounds and had everything to do with the power of Jesus on that cross. His full life, death and resurrection accounted for us in righteousness that we would be satisfied when we pursued Jesus. And that that... And that pursuit of Jesus would overflow to those around us. That we would not think it's all about us. We would not keep the blessing of Jesus to ourselves. And we would be streams of living water. And we would bring life 
and life to the fullest of those we encounter, not because we are great or because we are special, but because Christ is faithful to work through us as streams of living water. So be encouraged, church. And we are, hopefully next week we'll, have some, we'll be back with worship for sure. And may God just guide and direct you. Let's pray. Yes, Lord, we just thank you for the promise of Scripture that says you are enough. That you thirst, so I never have to, Lord. I thank you that we can be found in you. We can know our identity and our purpose and our drive and our everything in you and you alone. So we say thank you for that this morning, Lord. Lord, for some of us listening this morning, we know that we have drifted from your satisfaction. We have drifted or become stagnant, and we know stagnant is backwards in the kingdom. So, so we just want to repent of that, Lord, and say, Lord, we're sorry we, we've just drifted and wandered from, from the one I love, from the one who sustains me, the one who keeps me. We just pray, Lord, now as we pray that you would meet us, meet them, meet us where exactly where we are. Fill us fresh and new with the satisfaction of Christ. Satisfaction of the things of God, the awesomeness of God. From that, we would just continue to take responsibility to continue to pursue you in the Word, pursue you in community, pursue you in prayer and in worship and every aspect of our lives. And that would overflow in how we see others and how we see situations and how we, you know, how we actively place ourselves where the Spirit can use us to be thirst quenchers. So we say, thank you, God. We say, Lord, we pray that dangerous prayer that says, Lord, use me. Lord, use me. Use me to be a thirst creature in this world. So thank you, Jesus, in your wonderful mighty name. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.